Hello, welcome back to the Alexander Society. Otherwise known as Coping the Podcast. Coping the Podcast. We are a podcast about history. And I've also got copious amounts of alcohol surrounding me as I speak. Because that's that's the coping mechanism. It's not healthy, but it's appropriate. I mean, especially with the stuff we're going to be talking about on history. Oh yeah, this uh, this episode's gonna be one of those times. I tell you, I'll tell you that. So this week we're gonna do a little bit different. We're gonna try starting something we're gonna call a shitty sipper, where we both get something we think are gonna be awful drinks this week, and we're doing the same this week. We're gonna be doing the twenty four ounces of the hard Mountain Dews. Um, Derek missed one, but oh well. Yeah. Um... I didn't miss it. They just didn't have any in the store. That's fair. So what are you taking shots of tonight? I'm taking shots of something that the lady at the liquor store suggested. It's called Bullet Bourbon Frontier Whiskey. Uh, it smelled really good. I haven't tasted it yet. but Okay. Tonight I'm going to take be taking t- shots of Cuervo because that's what I could get too easy. Yeah, that's fair. Another thing about this podcast is we're very lazy and we don't plan ahead. It's uh, it's actually one of the more important aspects of our society. Procrastination is key. Yeah, I was still working on this script up until about two hours ago. <laughs> so Derek, why don't you go over our first rule for us? Our first rule is a shot at the start of the episode. So let's go ahead and do that. Prof. Cheers. So what's rule number two? Rule number two is if there is an event in our story where someone dies, we're going to take a sip. Yeah, pour one out for the homie. And rule number three, if we mention someone who is in a previous topic, we take a sip. Rule number four, if alcohol is mentioned, we take a sip. And rule number five, if there's an event in the story where somebody dies and alcohol is involved, we take a shot. And we also have an extra rule specifically for our Frederick the Great series. Because surprisingly, like I mentioned, we're very short on alcohol-related deaths for an episode that takes place exclusively in Germany. So we decided to include another rule. I have made a selection of some interesting or emotional or inspiring or disturbing quotes that I've picked out of my research and included them in the story. And whenever these come up, we're going to vote on it, decide whether we take a sip or a shot. Yep, because that's just how we cope this time. This time, this one time, no other time. Maybe some other times, I don't know. So this episode is going to run pretty long because I wanted to focus a lot on this war that we're about to talk about, which is the Seven Years War. And I wanted to focus on it a lot because there's a lot of frederick's personality and a lot of frederick uh a lot of his his genius and his sort of darker side comes out in a lot of the stories that we're that i'm going to explain over the course of this war so strap in it's gonna suck really bad so bear with me so when we left off i had explained the brewing storm in europe that was centered around the disruption created by Prussia's sudden thrust into great power politics in Europe. Outside of the empire, many monarchs saw Frederick's newly expanded realm either as a threat to be checked or as an opportunity to be exploited. Within the empire, the Habsburg Archduchess of Austria and Queen of Hungary, Maria Theresa, had reoriented her foreign policy towards a single-minded drive to retake Silesia from the Elector of Brandenburg. To that end, she took what was considered to be an unthinkable step. She abandoned Austria's decades-old alliance with Britain, and she joined with Austria's old nemesis, France, with the signing of the Anti-Prussian First Treaty of Versailles. Meanwhile, while this new order was being cemented, war was brewing in the American colonies. French and British colonists had long been having disputes over land claims in the Ohio River Valley, and that tension was starting to boil over. In an attempt to protect the interests of the colony of Virginia in that region, a young major 
age 22, who was in the Virginia Regiment of the Colonial British Army, by the name of George Washington, was sent with a force of 52 men to capture the French Fort Duquesne. On this expedition, he his force ambushed uh, and destroyed a small force of French troops at the Battle of Jumonville Glen, signaling the first shots of a general war in the colonies that is now today referred to as the French and Indian War. You probably you probably heard about that in like high school history, right? Yeah. Yeah, so Frederick's to blame for that too. Of course. Yeah. In just a couple of years, it would become the American front of an even larger war. With British forces now in open conflict with the French at the same time that their old ally Austria was courting France, the British throne decided it was time for a reorientation as well, and they signed a defensive treaty with Prussia in January of 1756. At this point, Frederick was well aware that he was in a very, very precarious position. He had the bayonets of five powerful nations at his throat, and he knew it was only a matter of time before they would decide to strike. So in typical Frederick fashion, he was determined to never be on the back foot and decided to strike first. This war he was about to start would become known as the Seven Years' War. It was the most destructive and devastating war on European soil since the Thirty Years' War over a century before. And it would come to be the first truly global conflict. Over a century later, Winston Churchill would remark that the Seven Years' War was, in actuality, the First World War. The proto-war you alluded to last episode? Yes. In addition to the main war in Europe, the belligerents, especially France and Britain, would fight over colonial possessions, both in North Africa and in the blossoming colonial administrations in India. So it was truly a global conflict. Colonialism had allowed wars to span the entire planet. Uh, this is when that first began. On August 29th, 1756, Frederick launched off this war with an invasion of Saxony. Saxony was an interesting choice because at this point, neither Saxony nor Poland were members of the anti-Prussian coalition, which only really included France, Austria, and Russia. This was more of a raw, practical decision. He wanted to occupy Saxony early so that he could keep the other nations from having a base of operations close to Berlin, which was only about 50 miles from the Prussian capital. Regardless of the reasons, Frederick's invasion and occupation of the city of Dresden was a complete diplomatic blunder. It was one of those rare times where he misjudged pretty badly. How so? Did it, did he just overestimate, or what happened? Uh, so during the occupation of Dresden, at some point, the the Queen of Poland um, had been like knocked over or somehow like beaten or mistreated. It's not really sure what exactly happened, but she was some in some way mistreated by Prussian troops when they raided the palace in Dresden, and she just coincidentally happened to be related to every single monarch in Europe. She was, um, uh, she was the, I think she was the cousin of Maria Theresa. She was the mother of the, um, the mother of the wife of the heir to the French throne. So the king, the French king's daughter-in-law and had co cousins or distant relations and basically every king, every duchy in germany so basically the worst piece of person to fuck with the worst person to fuck with and they they knocked her over or something I, it's not even really sure what exactly happened to her one story is that she was just straight up beaten by prussian troops another story was that while they were raiding the um the record storage where all of their correspond where all of the saxon electors correspondence were being stored that they opened up the door too quickly and knocked her out of the way. So not not really sure what happened. She got she got tossed around some way, and it pissed off everybody in Europe. And so that was the time when it turned from the coalition decided that this was not a war to check Frederick's power. Instead, it would be a conscious effort to cut apart and destroy the kingdom of Prussia. That was the new goal of this war. France, who had previously only committed 24,000 troops to any war with Prussia, was now marching into Germany with the full might of the French army, with at least 100,000 soldiers. France at, France at the time had the 
besides Russia, had the largest standing army of any country. And they were bringing all of them into Germany to fight, to fight Frederick. Uh, the Polish King Augustus was personally leading the Saxon army of 18,000 troops, and they had fled to a fortification in the mountains southeast of Dresden. After occupying Dresden, Frederick's army besieged the Saxons and were trying to starve them out. Maria Theresa sent an army into Saxony to relieve Augustus' army, but the Austrians were cut off by Frederick's forces and were pushed back at the first battle of the war, the Battle of Lobositz, on October 1st, 1756. So that's a sip. Shortly after that, Augustus surrendered, and with that, Poland and Saxony were pushed out of the war only about a month after Frederick had invaded. So he invades Saxony and knocks out uh, knocks out the Polish king, the elector of Saxony, knocks him out of the war within a month, just like that. Damn. And so the Polish king would, as part of this, con- as a concession for this surrender... The Polish king would allow Prussia to occupy Saxony, and Saxon troops were folded into the Prussian army and would serve Frederick for at least part of the war. Over the course of the war, Frederick would milk every cent out of Saxony that he possibly could. By the end of the war, the entire region was completely impoverished and destitute. He just, he took everything from these people. Every cent, some families who were like wealthy and well-renowned like throughout Europe had every single uh, cent and every work of art and every asset that they owned just taken from them and used to pay for Frederick's army. Damn. Keeping in mind, this was one of the richest areas in Europe. It was the, this exposed kind of an interesting quirk in Frederick's personality. He seemed to have a sort of humanitarian streak to him. Like he cared about, He cared very deeply when people were facing injustice and were starving or impoverished. But time and time again, he demonstrated that he never let that get in the way of his military objectives. He, yeah, he would openly regret the terrible things that he did to Saxony for years after. Uh, Later in the war, he sent a letter to his friend, an Italian philosopher named Francisco Algarotti, who it's also speculated was one of the guys he had a relationship with. And he said... He said, quote, I spared that beautiful country, but now it is utterly devastated. Miserable madmen that we are, with only a moment to live, we make the moment harsh as we can, amusing ourselves with the destruction of masterpieces of industry and time. We leave an odious memory of our ravages and the calamities which they cause. That's him talking about himself. He thinks he's a monster because of what he's doing, but he doesn't let it stop him. You're like, oh, I'm being a POS, but I'm not going to stop. How does that make any sense in your moral compass, you know? Because in his, in his analysis, the good of the Prussian state always came first and everything was justified in strengthening the Prussian state, which was the greatest good overall. Because if you sacrificed a region of people to save the state, then that state would go on to preserve the order and the, and the fortune of, the rest of the nation so that that's how he's looking at this he doesn't enjoy doing it which isn't an excuse like he's still a monster for doing this stuff like impoverishing an entire region like this is a monstrous thing to do but he has an ideology behind it he has a reason why he's doing it which i think is important to keep in mind to better understand who he is and what he's trying to accomplish i mean yeah but still yeah but still like yeah uh did you want to do a sip or a shot for that quote i was thinking just a sip same it's one of those quotes i included more for the narrative than for uh the for the alcohol to be honest yeah um i mean it's a good quote but it's not really yes that strikes a chord it had taken frederick longer than he expected to subjugate saxony So he didn't have any more time to campaign before winter set in. He settled his army down to camp in Saxony, and by the following spring, in April of 1757, he decided that his best course of action would be to knock Austria out of the war before France and Russia had a time to mobilize their massive armies. He set his army out into Bohemia, and despite being deathly sick and running on almost no sleep, 
He confronted the Austrian army defending Prague on May 6, 1757. The Battle of Prague was an especially bloody one. The Prussian army lost 14,300 killed or wounded to the Austrian 13,600. That's a sip. And for some perspective, throughout this entire war, unless I mention otherwise, Frederick is always going to be outnumbered. He's, there's, there's never going to be a battle where he has superiority of numbers. Even, even like his big victories, he's almost always outnumbered. So both sides lost at this battle. Both sides lost one of their best generals. Frederick lost Kurt Christoph Graf von Schwerin, who was killed by a cannonball while he was rallying a line of retreating soldiers. That's a sip. There are a lot of these quotes that may or may not have actually be said, been said, but I'll include them anyways. Apparently his last words were, quote, let all brave Prussians follow me. Damn. That's just a sip for me. I mean, yes, it's just a sip, but that's like, that's a ballsy quote, you know? Yeah, that's a, a quote of, or it's a, it's a sip of respect. I'm sipping for my man von Schwerin. Yes. The Austrians, on their side, they lost. Uh, this guy was probably the best commander that they had. Tell me if you think this name is German. They lost a general named Maximilian Ulysses Brown. That doesn't sound German, does it? Uh, not really. No, it does not sound German at all. That's because he was Irish. Um, his family had taken the sides of the Stuarts during the English Civil War. And... After the Civil War was over, he and his family were uh, exiled from the British Isles. And his his father found his way to Switzerland, which is where Maximilian was born. And he eventually found his way into the service of the Austrian army. And he was, he was uh, leading a bayonet charge at this battle. And he had his foot, his entire foot blown off by a musket shot. Oh, damn. Yeah. Uh, he ended up dying of his wounds a month and a half later. So, sip. Before I went out for my boy. After the battle was over, uh, Frederick sat with his brother, Prince Heinrich, and they sobbed over there, over uh, von Schwerin's death. I thought I'd include that, because um, uh, von Schwerin was another one of Frederick's friends. Uh, we should have we should have put in a, a rule that every time one of Frederick's friends dies, uh, we take a sip. Yeah, that probably would have been a smarter rule to put. But then I wouldn't have had an excuse to put all these awesome quotes in here. You could, you don't need to like I actually that's something I want you to add to this show is like I would love more quotes when we can have quotes. Okay, yeah, I should probably have been doing that anyways. But after this battle, Frederick besieged Prague, but for weeks all of his attempts to take the city had failed. He was starting to grow concerned about Britain. Uh, he was afraid that if the French armies fighting the British in West Germany, if they threatened Hanover too much that King George would pull his armies off of the continent and leave Prussia exposed from the West. In that event, he wanted to be sure that his armies would be free to confront a French invasion. But he could only do that if there was no major Austrian forces threatening him from the South. So against the warnings of his generals, he decided to turn his army away from Prague and try to knock out a huge Austrian army of 60,000 that had just entered Bohemia and were camped near the town of Kolin. Yeah, it's, it's the town is called Colon. That, that's not a good name for a town, to be perfectly honest. It sounds pretty bad. For, uh, to, to, to give it to my people, the Germans, uh, it is spelled K-O-L-I-M. So, for what that's worth. Um, so yeah, this, this decision would prove to be a terrible mistake. He was outnumbered, having only 47,000 troops. And the Austrians were set up on a hill and well defended. After a long march on the morning of June eighteenth, he let his troops rest for a few hours, and then he ordered the advance at two in the afternoon. At first, the Prussians were doing really well; they were taking key positions, they were pushing the Austrians back. But at some point, something happened. A couple of his generals either disobeyed or misunderstood some direct orders from Frederick, and failed to launch attacks on key Austrian positions. Uh, this disrupted the rhythm of the Prussian advanced, advance, and it started to cause ripples in the Prussian lines, which the Austrians then exploited. 
and several Prussian uh, battalions started to flee. Uh, it it's believed that it was at this battle that Frederick coined the, a phrase which would be repeated several times throughout history. Uh, you've probably heard this said before by, or you've probably heard this quote associated with several different people because it's said a lot after this. As he was trying to rally a battalion of infantry to assault an Austrian battery position, he supposedly yelled out to them, quote, dogs, do you want to live forever? Have you heard that before? That's a pretty... It, it's, it sounds very familiar, but it also sounds very generic, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, it sounds generic because so many military figures throughout history have said it. And this is the first recorded time that it was ever said. So it was probably said before. It's just this is the only time we have, like, you know, proof. Maybe. I'm not really... It, it's not really clear. Um whether he actually coined this phrase or not, but this is one of the earliest associations or one of the earliest attributions of the quote. So that, that's just, just going to be a sip. Honestly, I, I, I mentioned how these would be dangerous. I've I'm already almost done with my first can. Oh Lord, my man. I, I told you it would be dangerous. Yeah. You drink, you end up drinking a lot more than me because I end up talking a little bit more than you. So I don't get as many chances to actually take that. More than a little bit, Derek. Well. How far are you in your beer so far? Um, um, I'd say I'd, I've got about a third of it down. I'm trying to take bigger sips. That, the, Yeah, like that Mountain Dew was like deceptive. I, I, I would have never guessed there's alcohol in there. Yeah, I wouldn't either. If somebody just handed this to me. I, I, would, I would say it tastes kind of it tastes kind of off, but I'd assume that's just like the sugar-free part of it. Yeah, like I... I guarantee you that's exactly what the sugar free version tastes like. Despite all of Frederick's efforts to reform his lines, all of his efforts failed and the Prussian line broke. The Austrians ended up chasing down fleeing Prussian soldiers and killing them until nine that night. That's another sip. A good thing I cracked open beer number two. Mountain beer. Oh my god. I This just makes me wish there... So I don't like the watermelon Mountain Dew... This tastes better than that. These were supposed to be shitty. What is going on here? I don't know. I I know I got good reviews from people about it, but I just assumed like, hey, people really like Mountain Dew. They want it to be good, so they're going to pretend it's good, or they're going to trick themselves into believing it, placebo effect-wise. But I'm not a Mountain Dew guy. This is good. I'm a Mountain Dew guy, so... Yeah, these are actually dangerous. <laughs> yeah, so... The Prussian army was... Obviously, after this awful defeat, they were in terrible shape. They'd lost at least 13,000 troops, and they lost all, They also lost 400 officers, which is an insane amount of officers to lose in a single battle. And that was a big problem, because that was on top of the Battle of Prague, where they'd lost 400 officers in that battle, too. So their, their officer corps was being depleted very quickly. They was getting fucked in the ass with no lube yeah they were getting murked they it, it's it's really bad for pressure right now this is not a good situation so i assume since we're this early in this episode he turns it around now in a sense in a sense he turns it around actually it's not really him that turns it around he pulls out some alexander levels of luck what he he pulls some alexander bullshit he pulls some not some alexander bullshit because that's actually stuff that alexander did he just gets lucky so he had no, like, he wasn't even involved in the luckiness? He gets lucky, but I'll explain this a little bit more once we get to the end of the war. But it's, he gets lucky, but the reason he was in a position to get lucky was because of his ability to hold out during this war. Because this war turns into, like, a grinding war of attrition. Um, he, his main... His criteria, the Prussian criteria for winning this war is just surviving. And the only way that he, he has, the only method he has for surviving is just to hold off all of these different armies from that are trying to invade Prussia for as long as he can possibly can until something changes and he's able to turn the diplomatic situation around. So he's, he's not going to be winning this on the battlefield. He's going to be winning this through just sheer force of will. And diplomacy, like, not in, like, the normal sense, but, like, politics diplomacy. Like, 
he played that right or am i wrong yeah yeah actually that's that'll be a big part of it is just um being able to uh play not really play people against each other but to know like when he has the upper hand diplomatically and he's able to leverage that at just a key moment uh i'll I'll explain it it'll make more sense uh when we actually get to it but okay so like like I said, Prussian army is in terrible shape from this point until the end of the war. Everything that Prussia, everyone in Prussia would be convinced that there was no hope of victory. Oh, wow. So like uh, hit the home country sentiment was bad. So like from this from this point until the end of the war in in six more years, this fucking war went on six more years. We're only a year into the war. I know you said it's this. I know you said it's the seven year war, but. It was that desperate after one year for Prussia? After one year, yeah. Because his only hope for getting out of the war quickly was to knock Austria out as fast as possible. And the Battle of Kolin uh, ended that hope. His, his defeat at the Battle of Kolin made sure that that wasn't possible anymore. Holy crap. From this point, Frederick, in his own mind, as well as basically everybody in his family and a lot of people in his country were convinced that at every step of the way during this war, Prussia was about to cease to exist. Like it was just around the corner that something would happen and, and Prussia would just be gone. So remember that and keep that in your head as we talk about some of the stuff that we're going to victory for Prussia would simply mean surviving with Frederick's head still on his shoulders. That is what victory would look like. So Frederick left Bohemia, but he left a small army under the command of Prince Heinrich, his younger brother, left that army to defend against any Austrian force that would try to march north into Silesia. He took the bulk of his army west to fight the French. Heinrich, though, he was pretty young. He had just started commanding. This was his first time commanding. And he was not as confident as his brother was at this point. He attempted, instead of holding the line, he attempted to retreat his army to the fortress at the town of Zittau in Saxony, which is just on the border of Silesia. He took a bad route through the mountains, and that slowed his army down too much, so that by the time he reached the town, it had already been burned to the ground by Austrian troops. Oh, damn. 10,000 civilians died in the flames. Holy shit. 10,000. That's insane. That's a lot. That gives you an idea of what kind of war we're dealing with here. A, A very devastating war, evidently. Wait until the Russians get here. The Russians aren't involved yet? They're involved. They just haven't gotten their armies there yet. They got a long way to march. Oh. Oh, shit. Uh, Heinrich was then forced to abandon the way into Silesia and just let the the Austrians come in. And Frederick was forced to abandon his push against the French before he even got, got a chance to confront them. And he le- went back and regrouped with his brother in Saxony. Even more bad news followed after that. He got a letter from his sister, Wilhelmina, that their mother, Sophia Dorothea, had died. So while this is all happening, he gets a letter and his his mother has died. So that's a sip. That had to suck. In the middle of a war and your mom dies. In the middle of a war that you're already convinced you're going to lose and your mom dies. Yeah, that, that would fuck with you. Yeah, and at this point he realizes that losing doesn't mean losing Silesia. Losing means losing his throne and losing the kingdom of Prussia. And likely his life. That was a real possibility too, yeah. All of the losses were piling up and it caused him to have a nervous breakdown that incapacitated him for three days. Do you blame him, to be perfectly honest? I, I get, I'm getting sweaty and anxious just thinking about the kind of stress that he was under. I can't tolerate stress. I'm not good with stress. And imagining the kind of stress he was under is making me like, physically nauseous but he pulled himself together and he left with his army to the saxon town of botson there he got even more bad news Uh, of course he did this is gonna be a long stretch of like like he wins a battle and then he gets a bunch of bad news (laughs) that's that's how this war's gonna go but the bad news he got was that the russian army was finally mobilized and had completely overrun east prussia so that, that bit of land in northern Poland that belonged to Prussia, that was now no longer in control of by the kingdom. That was now controlled by the Russians. Damn. 
And then after that, he found out that the British army had suffered an enormous defeat at the hands of the French at the Battle of Hostenbach. That's a sit because a lot of British people died. And uh, after that, the British demobilized their army of Hanover and stopped uh, stopped their stopped their campaign in Europe. They decided to focus on the war in North America instead. And so now the French army was free to go and fight Frederick, and we're now invading Western Saxony. So now he's got the Russians knocking at his doorstep. He's got the Austrians, who he's already been dealing with, and now he's got the French, who are very close at hand. He split his now very drained army to try and defend both Saxony and Silesia, but like I said, he's surrounded by surrounded and outnumbered by French and Austrian troops. But he did. But then he got a bit of good news. Uh, after taking East Prussia, and by the way, when Russia came into East Prussia, they just started sacking and looting and pillaging and killing. Rape and pillage. Yeah, it was... The Russian army had uh, these irregular cavalry troops called Cossacks, which were like a nomadic horse people that just lived in Russia and were allowed to just kind of hang out in exchange for uh, military service by the Tsar. Ow. Or in this case, the Tsarina. It was Tsarina Elizabeth. Uh, but yeah, they had served as like the the Russian army's like mounted police force for centuries. Damn. And they were notorious for how brutal they were on campaign because they would just go looting and pillaging wherever they went. And now they were doing that in East Prussia. Uh, but uh, then Frederick got news that the Russian army was actually forced to retreat back to Russia. Because they were so far away from home that their own supply lines couldn't keep up with the demands of their army. And that's going to be a regular fixture of this war. The Russians would come in, stay for a few months, maybe fight Frederick once or twice, and then they'd be forced to go back to Russia because they weren't getting enough supplies. That sounds dumb. It's re- it was really dumb. Uh, and Frederick thought it was dumb too, and so he ended up under underestimating how effective the Russian army actually was. Which at this time... The Russian army's always had a reputation for just being like a disorganized horde of peasants. Uh, but in this particular period of time, that was actually a misconception. The Russian army was actually very well trained at this period of time. And that was thanks in large part to the efforts of uh, like Peter the Great, who had taken enormous steps to modernize and industrialize his army and bring it up to the quality of western europe so they russia had a very effective army during this time period but there's still a reputation that they were just kind of a horde of illiterate peasants that didn't know what what how to fire a musket but we'll we'll get to that a little bit more because that is man that's gonna be bad for frederick later (laughs) i can't imagine how it would be good for him yeah um but that bit of news, it didn't improve Frederick's mood much. Obvious reasons, he was still in, still up a creek without a battle. No shit. It was about this time that he began to contemplate suicide. Can you blame the man? I can't say I do. Still a sensitive topic. I, I'm not advocating for suicide. No, I know. I know. <laughs> I just... However, however... If you're in that place, there's not many people who wouldn't at least contemplate the idea. Yeah, he was he was convinced that he was about to lose everything he had worked so hard for. Um, and I can only imagine at this moment, like, the ghost of his father kind of breathing down his neck. I, I can imagine him having a lot of nightmares involving his father during this time, which... And self-doubt. Like, at this point, you're going from, like, Lost to victory, lost to victory, probably. Like, not literally in that order, but, like, you're dealing with a lot of shit. It's gonna fuck with you. Yeah. Um, if I remember correctly, this battle is going to have, or this war is going to have a total of 16 major battles, I think. He's going to win eight of them. Oof. Oof, oof, oof. And one of those was actually more of a stalemate. But, yeah, so... He was starting to contemplate suicide at this point, but he never really took, he he never really considered like carrying it out. It was just on his mind. But at this time he did start carrying around a box of poison 
which he didn't intend to use on a whim. He intended to use it in the event that he was ever captured. So if he was ever in a position... It was more of a backup rather than a, I am planning on killing myself right here and now. Yeah, and it was, it, it was strictly just for in the event that he was in a position where he was about to be captured by enemy forces. That was the only time he would decide to actually go through with it. And you know what? Hey, you know what? To be honest, to be in that situation, he had to be very confident and very, like, mentally stable to be able to be like, okay, I'm going to plan for a worst-case scenario so I don't get captured, but I don't actually plan on carrying out killing myself like that. Like, do the amount of people I know that could probably do that without actually considering killing themselves without like a worst case scenario with this kind of stress he's going through. I will say one thing. He definitely was not stable at this point, but it is something about the way that his brain works is that even though he was a complete emotional mess, he was still able to keep the particular part of his brain that kept he was able to compartmentalize like his emotional turmoil separately from like his military duties. Okay. He was very good at, at doing that sort of compartmentalizing. So throughout this war, he's a complete mess. He's constantly having emotional breakdowns and things like that. When push comes to shove and it's time, it's time to do military stuff, he's able to turn on that part of his brain and just push all of the other stuff aside and get down to the biz down to business. And it's a very unique skill that you don't see in people very often. And it's just, a, it, it's something that he excelled at is the way he was able to compartmentalize that stuff. But guess what I'm about to say? More bad news came. No shit. In September, his second best general, remember his first best general had already been killed. His second best general, Hans Karl von Winterfeld, was killed during a small skirmish with Austrians near the town of Moise. I'm starting to suspect this doesn't have a good ending for Fedger. That's what I was thinking the whole time I was reading this. Like, this guy is supposed to live for like another 30 years after this. How is this happening? <laughs> but um, Winterfeld had been one of Frederick's closest friends for most of his life. And this guy had been Frederick's confidant during his treason trial and after Von Katze had been executed. So this is the guy who emotionally helped carry Frederick through all of that stuff. And now he was gone. Uh, he didn't have time to mourn, though. He didn't allow himself the time to be mourn for it. How? Like, this is one of, like you said, his was his close confidant, right? How, how does he get through this without mourning? Like, he compartmentalizes. He pushes it aside. He focuses on the task at hand. He comes. He comes back to it later. That that does not sound like someone who is neurotypical. That has that that that's some kind of neurodiversion, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm I'm inclined to agree with you. Actually, um, his at the very least, his brain didn't work like other people's do. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I get his his upbringing was way different, but like even then, that's that's not easy to do. Do you see why I'm kind of going in depth into this war? Because, yeah, how? Yes, like that's a very good reason to go in depth. One, it's seven years, but like, how the hell does he rule for another thirty years? Like you said, yeah. Um. The stuff he does in this war is going to have ramifications that we are still feeling to to this day. Holy shit, really? Yeah, um, the modern world was built on what he's doing right now. Damn. Yeah, and I am so excited to explain how because it's it's fascinating. It's it, this is the it's this information right here is exactly why he is one of my favorite historical figures is everything that we're talking about in this war and all of the consequences of this war. This is one of the most... This war had the same sort of ramifications on world history that like World War I and World War II did. And yet we don't know hardly shit about it. And we barely learn anything about it. Yeah. So, like I said, 
he didn't have time to mourn. He was marching his army out to the city of Leipzig to confront a Frank, uh, joined up Franco-Austrian army. He had been trying to force his enemy into battle for months now, but they had been avoiding a confrontation, trying to tire Frederick's army out. So they'd just been marching back and forth all through Saxony. But the officers in the French camp were starting to get tired of marching back and forth through foreign territory, and they, they actually threatened a mutiny, and they forced their general, who was named... Uh, okay, it's French. Charles de Rohan, the Prince of Soubise. Uh, th that guy... I'll just call him Subiz. That's that's what he's referred to in the text. That's an obnoxiously long name. Um, so they forced their general Subiz to meet the Prussians near the town of Rosbach. Now that's Eve. Now for American listeners, that's not going to mean anything. But if for some reason we have German or French listeners who are listening to this, the name Rosbach has immediately perked up their ears. They are 100% going to know what this battle is. This is one of the most important battles in European history. On November 5th, 1757, outnum the French and the Austrians outnumbered the Prussians 41,000 to 21,000. They advanced against Frederick right into a trap. He had tricked the Allied force into believing that he was retreating his army which he had actually hidden behind some hills. When they came forward to occupy the site of the Prussian camp, Frederick ordered his army forward and struck the, his enemy in their right flank. The battle was over in just two hours. That is ridiculous. A battle over that quickly? Yeah. Uh, a battle involving over 100,000 troops over in two hours. Listening, listen to these casualty numbers. Keep in mind, this was only like 300 years ago. These are 100% accurate numbers. The Austrians lost 5,000 troops dead or wounded. Another 5,000 captured. The Prussians only lost about 500. I severely doubt that. Eh, you're free to do that. And, oh, Well, they're like... In a so that many people dead, like that many people on both sides. I I imagine it's kind of hard to track, like even with uniforms, like some uniforms are going to be destroyed, uh, are like that easy to do that, but like it feels hard to believe that the casualties were that low, just like with Alexander. Well, the thing about this is that a lot of these numbers. This was the point at which military science was actually starting to become a thing, and people were actually starting to keep, like, rosters of their troops. And so these numbers are taken directly from the Prussian army rosters. Okay. They, for a, f they for a fact, only lost 500 troops at this battle. Oh, wow. And not even all of those were killed. That, that's killed and wounded. Wow. Holy crap. The effect that this victory had on Prussia's war effort was immediate and astonishing. Because this battle was conceptualized in the larger, it was the larger context of uh, European society and culture and history. It was the two premier Catholic nations on the continent, France and Austria, had for the first time in the same battle been humiliated by a Protestant nation. In Prussia and all across Germany, Protestants were now looking at the war as a Protestant crusade against Catholic oppression. Damn. This was further reinforced by outrage at the French. The, so when the French army lost at this battle, they retreated back to France, back to the region of Alsace through Germany and all the way through Germany, even through non-combatant nations. Uh, they were just looting and pillaging their whole way through. And that caused a huge amount of outrage throughout Germany. And so in general, like this battle put uh, like the entirety of Germany on Frederick's side. Frederick, of course, he thought that this whole thing was ridiculous. Can you blame him? You remember what I said? Uh, he he hated religion. He despised religion. He he thought the idea of him being a representative of Protestant faith was the silliest thing that he had ever heard in his life. But 
he decided to let this happen because he noticed that it, it instilled a new fighting spirit both in his citizens and in his own army. So all of a sudden, everywhere he went, his his soldiers were more energetic. His his citizens were more supportive of the war effort. And all throughout Germany, he was getting public support, and people were now on his side. He did. It wasn't just Prussia anymore. It was he was getting at, at the very least moral support from large swaths of Europe. Okay. Is an interesting little tidbit. This is going to be a quote, but I didn't intend for it to be a sipper shot. Uh, but after the Battle of Rossbach, Voltaire, Frederick's old friend, actually referred to that battle as the day that German nationalism was born. Interesting. Keep keep that kind of pinned in your head. Put Stick a pin in that and keep that in mind as we go forward. The victory at Rossbach also convinced George II of Britain to remain in the war. And he actually returned his Hanoverian army to service and requested that Frederick's brother-in-law, Ferdinand von Braunschweig Wolfenbüttel, or Brunswick Wolfenbüttel in English. Frederick was married? Yeah, you don't remember that? No. That was the big point of his reconciliation with his dad. You did not mention that. You just mentioned they got reconciled that no i definitely mentioned it i definitely mentioned it i can pull up the i can pull up the script right now we can pull up the recording right now i definitely mentioned it it was a pretty big point okay so i think you mentioned engagement but not actual marriage but it, i should have probably assumed they got married at some point no i mentioned they actually i gave the date that they were married really yeah i've slept since then yeah <laughs> I I had to cut a lot of stuff out of here, and one of the things that I cut out was uh, F- Frederick and his wife's relationship. Um, so a lot of the reason that it hasn't come up a lot is because after he became king, he kind of shipped her off to a palace in Berlin, and then never talked to her. So it was more like a on paper marriage than a actual marriage. Yeah, it was a political marriage, but it was he. Even then, he didn't really treat it like a marriage at all because, again, he was gay. He was not attracted to women. He had no interest in having women in his life. And so, because... Does it ever come up, does he ever sire children? No, he never has a child because he only he only sees his wife like twice a year, if that. So, but yeah, my guy, I, I definitely mentioned the marriage. Also, the very last line of the last episode that we did was a quote from a letter that he wrote to his wife. And I said, the very last line of the script was, he did not see his wife again for seven years. Okay, yeah. I guess I'm It just, I've slept since then, like I said. <laughs> My man. I am almost finished with the second, like I'm like halfway through the second can. Give me a, some slack. My brother in Christ. But yeah, his brother-in-law, uh, Ferdinand von Brunswick Wolfenbüttel, was put in command of the British army in Hanover. So now that the French were being dealt with for the time being, being held up by the army in Hanover, he decided it was time to return his army to Silesia, which in the meantime, because it was undefended, had been taken over by another Austrian army. On his way there, he picked up the remains of the defense army, that had been devastated and demoralized by the Austrian advance into Silesia. He knew that he was about to have a battle, and he had to have these men in fighting condition if he wanted to push the Austrians out by winter. So he did something that he absolutely despised and never wanted to do, and that he would never do again. He mingled with his troops. Remember, uh, like, the last episode I mentioned, he really didn't like common people. He kind of had, like, this nascent like rich guy disgust for just poor people in general. I feel that like rich people sometimes are the worst. Yeah. That that's kind of how Frederick was. Um, and he, especially like, he just didn't like his own soldiers. He didn't like interacting with them. He didn't, he didn't like being around them. He thought they were gross and poor. Um, to be honest, it almost seems like he didn't like people in general. Yeah. He was definitely kind of, kind of arrogant. I I say kind of arrogant. He was very arrogant with, and that kind of manifested alongside like his upbringing in like a, a disdain for uneducated people. But 
in this particular instance, he decided he knew that being amongst them and mingling with them and speaking to them would help raise their morale, which is exactly what he needed from them. According to the sources, the men wept when they saw him because by this point he was now like a legendary conqueror. He was he was starting to become like a demigod figure in Prussia. Like you said, similar to Alexander Parallels. Yeah, Alexander Parallels. Hey, that's a sin. Beat me to it. Many of the men there started re to refer to him by a nickname that he had had since childhood. Like, this is what his dad called him. They started to call him Fritz, which is like the nickname for... It's the German nickname for people named Frederick. Okay. He would actually be called Fritz by his subjects for the rest of his life. Like, that was his, nick that was his nickname that just everyday Prussian citizens had for him. They, If he said, oh, yeah, that's old Fritz, they were talking about their actual king. Interesting. There's a story that at one point during this mingling, he came across a Frenchman who he recognized as having deserted from his army early on the, in the, early on the war. So this, this Frenchman was actually a member of his army, and he recognized him as being a guy that had deserted at some point prior. When Frederick asked the man why he had deserted the poor guy was so terrified that he was about to be executed that he started stumbling over his own words try like trying to answer him or give him a good excuse but frederick cut him off and saved him the trouble and he told him quote i tell you what come and fight today and if i lose we'll both deserve tomorrow <laughs> i thought that was i thought that was a pretty good one is that a sip or shot i want to say sip i'll tell you what i'll take a shot because i really want a shot you can take a sip how's that sound that sounds good to me. So that mingling, it did the trick. And his now bolstered army marched out to meet the Austrians at a little place called Luton on December 5th. The Prussians were victorious at this battle, dealing out 7,000 casualties to the Austrians and capturing about 12,000, which are insane numbers. <laughs> yeah, so the Austrians had 7,000 dead and wounded and 12,000 POWs. And they successfully drove the Austrians back to the city of Breslau. Soon after that, the army of Breslau surrendered, and the entire Austrian army in Silesia was now non-existent. It just didn't exist anymore. Just like that, Frederick had reconquered Silesia in less than a month and taken down an Austrian army in the process. Holy crap. When she heard the news about the fall of Breslau, Maria Theresa reportedly said, quote, in the end, God will have pity on us and crush this monster. That's a sippity sip for me. Yeah, it is a sip, but the people who are usually confident God's in their corner historically, not like in actuality, oh, I'm relying on God, and it's like a footnote in history, it doesn't seem like it plays out to their favor very often. Not typically, no. Just from my admittedly limited experience, but... Same. Frederick wintered his army in Breslau, and in March 1758, he set back out. He cleaned up the last bit of Austrian resistance in Silesia, and then he invaded the Austrian province of Moravia with the intention of marching on Vienna after that. So he feels confident that he's in a position he can actually march on the capital of Austria. So maybe he's bounced back, to, bounced back a little bit. Maybe he's rebounding. Yeah, maybe. On June 18th, one year to the day after his disastrous defeat at the Battle of Kolin, while he was besieging the city of Olmutz, he received word from Berlin that his brother and heir, Augustus Wilhelm, had died of a brain tumor. Oh, yeah, that's not good. Yeah, his, his brother is dead now. And so the inheritance passed to Augustus Wilhelm's oldest son, Friedrich Wilhelm. So we have another Friedrich Wilhelm in this story. What? <sighs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a sip, too. That's so weird. So after that, his forward momentum turned and a shipment of supplies. Do what? Can you really blame him after losing that many people close to him? Well, his, his momentum didn't turn because his brother died. His momentum turned because... Um, a shipment of supplies and his supply line were destroyed by an Austrian army. Wow, that's interesting. And so, yeah, so he didn't have enough supplies to keep up the siege, and so he was forced to retreat. He was able co to compartmentalize that. Yeah, yeah, he's he has a he had a fascinating mind. Really, really interesting how his mind worked, and I I still can't really wrap my my head around it. Despite the fact that he had to retreat from this siege, he was still in a moderately safe position. The Hanoverian army was still keeping the French at bay. 
And the Austrian commander seemed to seemed understandably hesitant to meet Frederick in battle at this point. This was a good situation because now he had to head north to deal with a Russian army, which is now pushing its way into Brandenburg. The Russians have finally arrived. Like I said before, he thought that this would be a cakewalk because he thought that the Russian soldiers weren't much more than a horde of peasants. And he thought he'd, he'd just kick them out really easily and then get back to the task at hand. Instead, he very narrowly defeated the Russians. It was kind of more of a stalemate. But he fought the Battle of Zorndorf at the cost of 13,000 of his own troops. That's a sin. It was really only considered a Prussian victory because after this, the Russian supply chain once again broke down and they were again forced to return to Russia. Uh, at one point during the battle, his uh, line of his infantry had begun to break, and he personally led them in a bayonet charge against the Russian troops. The painting that's currently the banner on our podcast Twitter account is depicting that charge. It was a charge at the, ba- yeah, the Battle of Zorndorf. So Frederick returned south to Saxony to reunite with his brother Heinrich. The Austrians had once again moved back to Silesia, but he wasn't able to do anything about it because the main Austrian force was still threatening Dresden. Frederick moved his army to camp near a town called Hochkirch, H-O-C-H-K-I-R-C-H, Hochkirch, which is actually how you pronounce it in German. I'm not making that up. This turned out to be another one of his great mistakes. So there is this Austrian commander. His name was Leopold Josef von Don. And thus far, Frederick had fought him a couple times, and von Don seemed always hesitant to attack Frederick. And so he figured he could camp down here, and von Don wouldn't try and attack him because it'd be out of character. That was despite the fact that his army was now in like a wide open position and just begging to be attacked. He gambled poorly, and on the morning of October 14th, 1758, the Austrians attacked the Prussian camp while they were still asleep in their tents. During the confusion of the massacre, the Austrians set fire to the town, and it completely burned to the ground. Over 5,000 Prussians were killed, including Frederick's third and fourth best generals. He lost two more generals. How does this man rule for 30 more years when he lost his four best goddamn generals? (laughs) He lost James Francis Edward Keith, who he was very close friends with, and he lost his brother-in-law, Frederick Francis of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel. That's a sin. Damn. But this battle turned out to not be a complete defeat. Frederick was actually able to form up a battle line out of his retreating troops, and he dealt out 6,000 casualties to the Austrians, meaning that von Don ended up losing more troops in this engagement than Frederick did. Yeah. Frederick was really good at this. <laughs> also, Frederick was able to retreat in just the right way that he was able to cut off the Austrian army's path to Silesia, which was still, again, like Austria's main objective was Silesia. And so that forced von Don to retreat towards Dresden. <sighs> now I've got more bad news for Frederick. It's just bad news all the way down. Hit me. Not only had Frederick lost another of his friends... That guy, James Keith. But on the same day as the Battle of Hochkirk, his sister Wilhelmina had died. Ah, fuck. Yeah, that's exactly what I said, too. (laughs) Oh, that's a... Oh, my God, I'm so sad right now. I'm gonna drink to that. He had lost his mother, his brother, his sister, and half of his best friends in less than a year. This man cannot catch a motherfucking break. Literally all of the people who had helped him through his childhood were now dead. None of the people that were his emotional support through his time as a child being relentlessly beaten by his father, none of those people were alive anymore. For the rest of this year, when he wasn't marching or doing military business, he would lock himself up in his tent and refuse to speak to anyone. And you blame him? Even in his darkest moments of his life, he had always been very energetic and talkative. But from this point for the rest of his life, he would be more quiet, more somber. He'd be more bitter and cold to the world. And on top of that, the stress of this campaign was starting to wear on him. His hair was starting to turn gray. He was becoming dangerously thin from malnutrition. And his teeth were starting to fall out. I still don't know how this man lasted as long as he did ruling with all this shit happening to him. And then on top of all that, one of his one of the ways that he de-stressed, that he kind of relaxed himself, was playing flute. Now that his teeth were falling out, it was making playing the flute harder. You're just, like, throwing blow against blow against blow against him. Also, he started having attacks of gout and rheumatism, and uh, the gout and rheumatism never went away. It, it'd be with 
he'd, it'd be with him for the rest of his life. <laughs> My man cannot catch a break. He was, it, it was so bad. It, I, it, I, I actually, when I was working on this script, when I got to about this point, I actually sat it down. I just, I saved my Word document and I just shut my computer off and I went and laid down. It was actually a... F- you have to take a break at that point. It was, it was, this, this is actually affecting me emotionally. <laughs> yeah, like, you can't hear about, like, I don't care who you are, unless this is your worst arch nemesis or whatever. You can't hear about someone dealing with this much trauma back to back to back and not feel bad for them so he had he'd driven the austrians out of silesia and he wintered his army in breslau despite everything up to this point for the time being he still controlled silesia and saxony but this coming year 1759 would almost be deadly for frederick on top of the fact that all of his loved ones were now dead and so many of his veterans had been killed that his army now mostly consisted of raw recruits some of his replacement officers were as young as 15 so you had 15 year olds leading like entire regiments what the fuck this this war was devastating to prussia like the prussian people you had literal children now not not just you didn't have child soldiers you had child officer the people leading these armies were now teenagers how how does it get that bad how how do you not pull out from the war surrender like he's fighting half the continent right now but he surrender just isn't his it isn't in his understanding of war he doesn't surrender it, it's it's a foreign concept to his mind yeah but at some point you gotta be like this even surrender has to be better fuck but you gotta, you gotta remember surrender meant that he lost his throne Surrender meant that everything that his family had been working for for four generations comes crashing down and ceases to exist. He couldn't live with himself if he allowed that to happen. He would genuinely... So he was a prideful douche. Like, I feel like, again, I've never had that kind of power. But if I was in his shoes, I would have just been like, okay, it's time to surrender. And if I'm not in charge, I'm not in charge. I'm obviously not doing the right thing for my people at this point. And he just, it, like, when I talked about his philosophy on, on like, the state, he be, he didn't believe that it was, to some extent, he didn't really believe it was his decision to make. He believed it, like, the decision was his, but that it would be a failure of his duties as the king in service to the state. How do you not go through this war and not recognize that you are fucking failing at this point? Because even if he turns it around, at that point, he was failing. Yeah, um, I I honestly can't explain it. I can't I can't tell you what exactly was going through his mind that was justifying him continuing this. But and I I can't believe I'm saying this. It all it all turns out okay in the end. <laughs> and it's like that sounds like bullshit. It sounds like bullshit, and I feel like a bullshit artist saying it. So they're going into 1759. Most of this year was actually quiet. So at this point, every belligerent, every nation that was involved in this war were in the process of rebuilding their armies because they had all been so devastated by the fighting. And they were mostly focusing on like diplomatically outmaneuvering one another. But in August, an Austrian army marched north and joined with a fresh Russian army under the command of, I, I love Russian names, the only reason I included this guy's name, he's not important to the story. I just wanted to include his name. His name is Pyotr Semyonovich Sal- Sal- God damn it. Pyotr Semyonovich Saltikov. You included his name and you couldn't get it fucking right. Yeah, I'm I'm getting drunk too. Man, those things are dangerous. <laughs> those- You're a hack and a fraud. I'm a hack and a fraud, yeah. So yeah, uh, Mr. Saltikov uh, tried to march on Berlin. Frederick marched north, and he cut the Allied army off near the town of Kunersdorf on August 12th, 1759. This would be the worst defeat that Frederick ever faced. The Prussian army was completely crushed, and half of his army was killed or wounded. That's a sip. During this, at the when this battle was, as his line was collapsing and retreating, Several of his of Frederick's cavalrymen had to physically drag him from the battlefield to keep him from charging headfirst alone into the Russian lines. So what's happening now is he's actually trying to... I said that he never actually tried to kill himself. Now he's, to some extent, he's actually trying to kill himself now. He's just running headfirst into the enemy. He doesn't want to 
to kill himself himself but he at this point he's kind of decided that like okay well if if I'm going to die anyway, so I might as well try to die in battle. And so some of his cavalrymen had to physically drag him away from the battlefield to keep him from doing this. That, that tracks. Yeah. In the days that followed, the Russian Cossacks would spend all of their free time traveling around the battlefield, finding any Prussian survivors that had been wounded and left on the battlefield, and just killing them. They just killed all of the survivors that they found on the battlefield. Doesn't really surprise me, but I'm still disappointed nonetheless. It's that kind of war, man. That kind of war. That's sick. So after the Battle of Kunersdorf, again, the worst defeat that Frederick would ever face, he fled to a local farmhouse, and he began preparations to transfer his rule, the rule of his kingdom, to his brother, Prince Heinrich. Because at this point, his actual heir, uh, Friedrich Wilhelm, was still just a kid. Uh, he At this point, he knew that the Allied army would soon be at the gates of Berlin, and Prussia would be subjugated because your army's out of commission for the time being, and your capital's being occupied. Like, you, you've you lost at that point. Yeah. But then a miracle happened, and Frederick had an Alexander-level stroke of luck. Ooh, do tell. Days passed, and that Russo-Austrian army that had beat him at Kunersdorf was nowhere to be found. What? It never arrived at Berlin. It never sealed the deal and struck the final blow it turns out the russians were frustrated by how many casualties they had at the battle and were accusing the austrians of forcing russian troops to bear the brunt of the fighting at kunersdorf they were refusing to advance until maria Theresa compensated their army with a shipment of supplies the austrians didn't have any supplies to spare because they were nearly bankrupting their country on this war so the Russian army just left and went back to Russia. The amount of luck that Ruhetta took, that feels like even beyond Alexander luck, to be honest. Now, I know the I know the term dumb luck gets thrown around a lot. This is dumb luck, without a shadow of a doubt. This is the dumbest luck that has ever happened. <laughs> For all intents and purposes, Frederick had lost the war at the Battle of Kunersdorf. But because of infighting in the anti-Frederick coalition, he came out of it. This is more than lucky some bitch. This is like, you got whatever higher power you believe in was just like, okay, you're not going to die today. You're not going to win, but you're not going to die today. And what I mentioned before that um, his vic that his, his winning, because his, he is going to win this war. His, his winning this war involved... A huge amount of luck, but also his own skill being able to capitalize on that luck. And this is one of those moments. Any other commander in this situation wouldn't have been able to rouse to rouse an effective army after a defeat that devastating, like at Kunersdorf. No. Like, no. Like, by all rights, he should have just lost the war. There, like... Could any historian have blamed him for losing the war? No, at this at this point, everybody would be like, "Yeah, it was tough, tough break, but it happens." But no, even but even with this stroke of luck, any other commander with the stake that their army, with that Frederick's army was in, wouldn't have been able to do much. But he took the opportunity. He wintered in Saxony. Um, he was still able to bring his army back from this. I don't know how. I... He kept his army intact and coherent just by sheer... Because at this point, like, his... This is something I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But the idea of Prussian patriotism was being born out of this war. And his his subjects, the people of Prussia, were now almost worshipping. He was legendary now. They loved him so much. And it was that respect that he was able to command that was able to keep his country and his army coherent through all of this his soldiers loved him so much that even despite the defeat at kunersdorf they were able to give 110 percent the entire time that is how powerful his personality was and how effective he was this man is next level luck like like that is legit alexander levels lucky and no like alexander feels m like he's already been mythologized yes i know we have so much 
knowledge about Exalander. It has to be true. That's all we can tell. But like this feels made up. And I get and again I know it's recent enough that we know it's not. But the amount of luck, it just feels unreal. And it really was unreal. Like Frederick himself, like he wasn't for a long time in his life, he wasn't able to process the fact that um like he wasn't mentally or emotionally able to process the fact that he didn't lose his throne during this war. It just he didn't he never really talked about it. He for years after the fact, he always talked about this war in very cold and sterile terms. He it was never he he never demonstrated any emotional investment into it, even though this was easily the most emotional period of his life. So it was it was exactly the same for him. He was never able to really come to terms with how close he came to losing everything. But yeah, so Frederick spent yet another winter in Saxony. And despite the Allied failure to capture Berlin, it didn't seem like Prussia had much left in them. A Prussian force sent to drive off an Austrian army in Saxony ended up surrendering without firing a shot. So an entire, like, 10, 10 maybe 13,000 men, Prussian troops, they just, without even fighting the Austrians in, in eastern Saxony, they just surrendered without doing anything. And that opened the way for Austria to come in, and they ended up occupying the city of Dresden. So Dresden was now in Austrian hands. Frederick knew that this was not a situation that he could tolerate, so he went and he besieged Dresden. But then he received word that the Russians were back, and they had an army in Silesia. And they were going up and down, and doing their Cossack stuff and looting and burning and pillaging and killing. He wanted to speed up the surrender of Dresden so he could get out to Silesia and deal with the Russians. So he made a decision that would be one of the greatest black marks on his legacy. And to this day, you remember when I mentioned that the people of Dresden would have a very different opinion of him? Yes. This is when that happens. He ordered his cannons to fire on the city. Damn. Hundreds of years of history. And some of the most beautiful architecture in Europe, including the famous Kreuzkirche, which was a beautiful Baroque-style Lutheran cathedral, were all destroyed. Wow. And that's not to mention the... That's a sin. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that too. That's a sip. I said sin, not sip, but agreed. <laughs> You're slurring your words. Uh, no, that's just a really easy way word to confuse one way or the other with my accent normally all that destruction is not to mention the hundreds of civilians that were killed hundreds of people were killed by this bombardment yeah a decade earlier only hundreds like that sounds like something that would be thousands it probably I, i'm i'm not really sure i couldn't find an exact number i could only find references to like hundreds but that that does like i'm it's not just me it does feel like something that would be in the thousands yeah yeah, I agree with you. It sounded a little low to me, too. But even still, like, killing hundreds of civilians with this attack, all of those people also, can, a decade before, had considered Frederick to be one of the greatest rulers in Europe. And now they were dead because of his bombardment. Uh, that's another sip. So, yeah, that's something I keep hammering home to people. You can't have political power unless you're actively doing awful, evil shit. That's that's just part of what comes with political power. And Frederick was no different. As commendable as he was in many other respects, this had to happen. It was just part of like who what what ha what goes along with the kind of power that he had and the kind of situations that he would be put in as a person with the kind of power he had. This attack though, that bombardment of the city, it failed. And so all of those deaths and all that destruction was for nothing. And he was forced to abandon the siege. And like I said, the Russians were committing numerous atrocities in Silesia. And it was starting to negatively affect his taxes. So his army was being funded by huge increases in taxes all throughout his kingdom. But especially in Silesia and Saxony, because those were the two wealthiest parts of the lands that he controlled at that moment. He was starting to notice a noticeable dip in the funding coming in from taxes from Silesia because of how how devastating the Russians were, the things that the Russians were doing, destroying industry and 
farmland and things like that. So if he wanted to preserve that tax train, he would have to drive the Russians out. The Russians had occupied Breslau. So he went on his went over to Silesia, beeline for Breslau, and tried to dislodge them. He arrived in the town of Lignitz, where he was confronted by an enormous Austrian force who Yeah, there's Austrians there too now. They're fucking everywhere. They camped and each side prepared to fight. The night before the Battle of Liegnitz, a deserter from the Austrians, an Austrian soldier who deserted, had informed the Prussians that the Austrian commander intended to attack them before dawn. So they wanted to do the same thing they had done at uh, Hochkirk and try and attack them while they were sleeping. So Frederick moved all of his troops out of the camp and he set them up in a field nearby. So so all of the pet t- t- Tents were still pitched. He actually press ganged some local people, like some local peasants, to come into the camp and keep the fires going so that the Austrians thought that they were still there. And they just laid there in an open field, and Frederick joined his men and just slept beneath the stars. He had scouts posted on his perimeter, and they came and informed him just as the sun was coming up on August 14th, 1760, the Austrians arrived at a now empty Prussian camp. And the Prussian army, now formed up, came out of nowhere and hit them right in the flank. The Prussians dealt out 6,000 casualties to the Austrian, Austrians and captured 4,000 of them. That's a sin. The remaining Austrian and Russian forces that were still in Silesia, uh, they retreated and they left Silesia. So once again, Frederick now controlled Silesia again. Can you guess what I'm about to say? Honestly, I have no idea where this could go. More bad news. Makes sense. The following October, after this battle, another Russian army swept into Brandenburg. And while Frederick is too far away to do anything about it, they besieged Berlin. And after a five-day battle, the, the citizens of Berlin actually armed themselves and joined the garrison at Berlin and fought the Russians for five days. But they were pushed back, and the Russian army occupied Berlin. That's sick, because a lot of people died. There were some Austrian troops with them, and surprisingly, there was a little reversal. So this time, it wasn't the Russians that were going out and killing and looting and pillaging. It was actually the Austrians, and they were just killing indiscriminately all across the region. That's another sip. But those uh, those Austrian and Russian troops, they didn't end up staying. So pretty soon after they arrived, a rumor began to float around that Frederick was marching north. And they decided they didn't want any of that heat, and so they left Brandenburg. So they had Berlin in their hands, but they were so scared of Frederick at this point that they decided, Ugh, we don't want to risk a battle with that guy, so they left. Frederick would... After that, Frederick went and he drove the uh, contingents of the Austrian army out of Saxony, but he was never able to dislodge them from Dresden. And there would be an Austrian army in Dresden f- until the end of the war. But he was he managed to drive out the, the rest of the Austrians out of Saxony at the Battle of Torgau. Which, that's sad. They wintered in Saxony again. 1761 came. By this point, his entire country was completely drained. He couldn't, there, there's just nobody left to take taxes from. The, they'd spent so much money on this campaign that they just didn't have any, any, they had just barely enough, Frederick had barely enough money to keep his army coherent, but he didn't have the funds to get them the supplies so that they could go on the offensive. At the same time, none of his enemies were daring to attack him anymore. They pretty well learned their lesson by this point, not to engage Frederick in direct battle. But he was completely helpless to do anything when Austria once again moved armies in and occupied Saxony and Silesia. He literally didn't have the money to stop them. And he lost Silesia and Saxony after retaking them both countless times already during this war. At the same time, Sweden was getting involved. And it occupied the coastal region of Pomerania. On top of that, George II of Britain, he died. He was dead now. That's a sip. And his son, 
George III, was very eager to make peace because at this point the British had beat the French in America and George III was the first of this ruling family of Britain to not have been raised in Germany. So they had all been Germans raised in Hanover, but he was the first one who had been raised in Britain. He didn't really care about Hanover all of all that much. And so he didn't see a real need to defend it. And so he didn't see a need to be at war with France anymore. And so he was starting to pull more and more resources away from the war effort. So 1761 went by uneventfully, and Prussia was once again on the verge of defeat. This war was a war of attrition, and Prussia was just out of steam. They were, they were done. It was, it was pretty much over. And then everything changed. Everything flipped around out of nowhere. On January 5th, 1762, the Tsarina Elizabeth of Russia kicked the bucket. She was dead. That's a sim. That was the person that he was going against a lot, right? Um, you're probably thinking of Maria Theresa of Austria. That's who I was thinking of. Who did kick the bucket then? The Tsarina of Russia. The leader of Russia. Interesting. Yeah, so she died. And her nephew, Peter III, ascended to the throne. Peter idolized Frederick. Frederick was his hero. And on his ascension, his first priority was saving Prussia. What? That makes no sense. Yes, it doesn't make sense. It only makes sense in the context of dynastic politics. Uh, give me an overview of dynastic politics. Dynastic means that political positions are inherited. So when the last guy dies, it passes to their child. Uh, so basically familial succession. Yeah, so Peter just happened to not like this war that his mom was raging, or that his aunt was raging, actually, not his mom. And he had been reading the written works because Frederick had been writing books and poetry and stuff this whole time. And... He consumed all of that religiously. And he was, like, Frederick was to Peter what Voltaire was to Frederick. Wow. And now Peter was the Tsar of Russia who was at war with Frederick. This sounds like Alexander-level bullshit luck again. This is Alexander-level bullshit. He ordered that his troops in Germany switch sides and place themselves under Frederick's command. Wait, what? He, like, went full in? Like, I, he just went, he went full in. Like, I, I didn't think he would do that. Like, I thought he, maybe he would be like, okay, we're not going to attack Prussia anymore. Or like, maybe we'll support them. Not like, okay, you are under his command now. Yeah. Don't get too excited. It's not going to last very long, but. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's not, it's going to come out of left field too. But he put all of his, his army under Frederick's command, and he returned East Prussia to uh, Prussia's control. Sweden, who were relying on Russian support to occupy Pomerania, now no longer had Russian support. And so they left Pomerania, and so Frederick got Pomerania back. Dang. Like it... <sighs> Unfortunately, Frederick wouldn't have a chance to use those Russian troops, because only a few months after that, Peter's wife had him assassinated. What? Yeah. Only a few months after he came to the throne, his wife had him assassinated. That's a sip. Wow. That was like, you, you, you're, you're sucking Frederick's stick too hard. You gotta die. Um, after, after he was assassinated, his wife would actually take the throne. She became Tsarina Catherine II, also known to history as Catherine the Great. She was a great too? Yep, she was a great too. Probably the most famous leader of Russia in all of history. And America does not cover that stuff. And America doesn't cover it either. But yeah, that's how she came to the throne, by murdering her husband. Also, the guy, the two guys, or one of the two guys who murdered her husband, they were both generals in the Russian army. She was sleeping with one of them. Of course she was. <laughs> yeah. Um... But yeah, Catherine the Great, she comes to power. She doesn't go back to war with Frederick. She just pulls her army out and 
makes peace with Frederick. To be honest, I didn't see that coming because it, I guess because this episode is about Frederick, it, it felt like the reason why she killed her husband was because he was too close to Frederick. So I would assume she would take the complete opposite side. However, not everything is going to be about Frederick. Right. She killed him because um, he was pretty incompetent. And she was actually originally, I think she was, she was from Holstein, which was in Northern Germany. So she was actually ethnically German. But when she married uh, Peter, when he was still a prince, um, she got really, really into Russian culture. And she kind of became like a Russian nationalist. And so when he came to the throne, she didn't like how ineffective a ruler he was because he was he wasn't like very interested in ruling. He was just kind of interested in like doing rich guy stuff. So he wasn't so much a leader as he was, oh, I'm in a position of privilege. I became a leader. I don't know what to do with that. Right. Yeah. And um, typical of Romanov politics. Um, when a ruler is in that situation, he immediately gets killed. That's just, that's how Russian politics worked. And so I would argue that's how most politics work to be perfectly honest. That's not how it worked in Prussia for what it's worth. Well, I mean like, and I mean like back then, obviously it, it feels like if you weren't doing the, the thing you were expected to do, you kind of got bumped off. A lot of times, yeah, that's pretty common. But yeah, so he, but she knocked him off. She takes the throne. She ends up being one of the greatest leaders in Russian history. Uh, but she pulls out of the war. And so now Frederick only has the French and the Austrians to deal with. But hang on, then he got some more good news. In November, France signed a peace treaty with Britain. That brought France out of the war. They were no longer involved. So now it's just Prussia and Austria. Wow. He got really lucky with that, didn't he? Yeah, he did. So now Austria didn't have any allies left. And at this point, they were just as drained as Prussia was. On February 15th, 1763, Prussia, Austria, and Saxony signed the Treaty of Hubertusburg, which ended the war. So the way you're saying it doesn't sound like there was like a definitive winner. They both just kind of said it should be over. Is that how it went, or was there a definitive winner? Now, on paper, nothing changed. Everything went back to... It's, it, there's a term for it in diplomacy. It's called the status quo antebellum, which is Latin for the way things were before the war. I mean, yeah. And so Prussia would keep all of its conquests in Silesia, all of the maps would return to exactly what they looked like before the war. But that means that Prussia won. Basically, yeah. That was their that was their goal, was to keep Silesia and to keep Prussia intact. They accomplished both of those. Austria's, Austria's goal was to reconquer Silesia, and they failed. So Frederick won. By a technicality, yes. After all of, <laughs> after all of that. And I need to talk about this, because... Because it, it sounds like he, he just won through dumb luck, and I don't want people to come away with that impression. It wasn't just dumb luck. It was dumb luck that ended the war, but it was the skill that Frederick had in battle and the skill that he had in organizing his country so that it could bounce back from defeats that allowed his allowed him and his country to last long enough to get to the point where they could get out of it intact. Any lesser commander than Frederick would have lost this war very early on. He was he was facing insurmountable odds. I I know this is probably going to sound like a stupid remark, but I feel like even Alexander would have lost this war because it took us it had it had to be Frederick who was leading Prussia to win this war because the way things kind of worked out, it had to go that way or else the war was lost no matter what. Yeah, I I actually agree with you in, on this because Alexander, he was facing a significantly larger force, like just nation overall was his main enemy was Persia. But Persia was ne was already like politically weak 
and just had to be tipped over. They were never able to field an they were able to field armies that had the capability to defeat him, but he had the ability to stand toe to toe with them. But the thing about it is that Alexander was never facing a situation where he was completely surrounded on all sides by multiple uh, very well trained, very well armed nations that were all gunning for him at the same time. I don't know that Alexander would have been able to get out of that situation. I personally, obviously, again, not the history major. I don't think Alexander could have. Um, again, there are very few people historically as leaders um, that could have pulled this off. If any others could have pulled off a victory like this, I mean, it would have been a very, very hard for any other person to do this because Frederick wasn't even trying to get this kind of outcome. And it kind of just fell in his lap, it sounds like. It really did, yeah. But the big thing, I think, with Alexander was that Frederick had something that Alexander didn't. And that was that Frederick was just as much a political leader as he was a military commander. Alexander was never a politician. He was never, he would never have been able to organize a country or a culture or a society like Frederick did. Frederick didn't win. No, I, I, I completely agree on that. Alexander was a spearhead and he was a warrior. Alexander was, I'm going to fight till my last breath as much as I can. Frederick was not that. He was a, a statistician is the best word I can come up with at the moment. To use the words of Voltaire, he was the stere or he was the prototypical philosopher king. Like in like in the old writings of like the writings of Plato, he was the philosopher king he was comprehensively well well read and knowledgeable about all facets of leadership not just military or political or cultural everything he was he was comprehensively a genius in ways that alexander just wasn't frederick won he did it by the skin of his teeth by the skin of his teeth he returned to berlin he returned to brandenburg to a completely ruined country over the course of the war about four hundred thousand prussians both soldier and civilian had been killed that that was about 10 percent of the kingdom's population 10 percent a full 10 percent one out of every 10 people in prussia were killed during this conflict god dang it's one of those wars on top of that every part of prussia that had been occupied during the war that is to say every part of prussia had faced devastating destruction of buildings farmland industry everything luckily for prussia though they had frederick at the helm to lead their repairs Frederick would spend the last few decades of his reign modernizing his country. He introduced huge irrigation projects to create new farmland all over the kingdom, especially in Brandenburg, because Brandenburg was historically very poor, specifically because they didn't have a lot of arable farmland. He established new industries that created extremely profitable export goods like China and silk. He, this, this was really interesting to read about. He set up one of the first veterans' welfare systems in European history. What? He was one of the first ones to set up uh, a VA? Yeah, like, like, yeah, VA. That's exactly, he set up a VA. It included state-funded care for disabled veterans, um, pensions for rural veterans returning to peasant work, and it reserved jobs in public service for veterans who had fallen on hard times. He... He had a very interesting, I think something about this war kind of changed his perception of like everyday common soldiers because he didn't need to do this and nobody would fault him for not doing this. It's just, it was, nobody had done this before. It wasn't something you did in Europe. He did this because he genuinely had thought like these men have sacrificed life and limb for the country. They deserve something when they get home. There's something about the nature of this conflict that genuinely changed his opinion of like his own soldiers because like i like i mentioned before he did not like his own soldiers he thought that they were gross that they were poor and uneducated and boring and they were a tool for him to abuse but they weren't really people in his eyes to a certain extent yeah but after at the end of this war he went out of his way he used a, a pretty sizable amount of state funding to run these programs also, 
in addition to that, you remember that grain magazine system or that he, I mentioned it in the first episode, like at the tail end, he introduced one of like the earliest forms of welfare in European history. Yes. I remember you saying that. Yeah. So that, that grain magazine system where he just distribute grain. You didn't say how it worked. You just said that he had the earliest version of like a Welsh river system. Early. So the way that it worked was the first winter of his reign uh it was a it had been a really bad harvest and there were huge grain shortages all throughout brandenburg and so there is a system of grain magazines which are just stockpiles of grain that his father had set up and these stockpiles would be used for the army during times of war so they just have all of this grain sitting around and whenever they went to war they could just draw on these magazines and use them to feed the army during times of peace frederick would open up these magazines and just give the grain out to anybody who needed it, even though they were technically earmarked for the army during campaign. And so that that's considered to be one of like the first um, welfare systems ever devised in European history. And during this, this period after the seven years war, he expanded that to great to, he started building more and more of these grain stores and uh, sophisticating the bureaucracy around distributing that grain. His entire reign from this point forward was dedicated to strengthening Prussian society at large. It wasn't just about the state. The state had been saved and the state had been strengthened through the war. Now it was time to use the state to give back to the people who had sacrificed for it. That was the mentality that he had going into this. And so... As a result of all of these efforts, and because he was just such a brilliant administrator, he Prussia ended up coming out of this war even stronger than before the war, which is something that cannot be said about many of the other belligerents of the war. That sounds like a downright impossibility coming out of that war. That war sounds like it devastated everyone, no matter who what you were. There's no way you come out of that stronger. And yet somehow he did it. There's something very important and very fascinating that I'd like to talk about. And that is, I, I really, when I was writing out this script, I really had no idea how to put it into words. But I wanted to talk about the idea of Prussian patriotism. Because during this war, the people of Prussia began to develop their first sense of like Prussian identity. And they started to demonstrate what we would call like nationalism or patriotism towards the idea of being Prussian. And it was, it was born out of just the horrors that were being faced by the everyday person throughout Prussia, uh, either through like the impoverishment just inherit like the economic downturn that's inherent to what happens during the war or through actual violence that was faced at the hands of occupying armies. But over the course of this war, people began to see themselves in a way that had never been, that had never happened in Prussia before. And that was that they started to see themselves as having a common cause with every other Prussian citizen. During this period, they were really legitimately fighting for their existence as a nation. And a whole bunch of different factors in the war combined to create a completely new national identity where it hadn't existed before. Before this, people had people in Prussia had considered themselves either a Berliner or a Brandenburger or a Pomeranian or... Uh, like a Prussian in East Prussia. After this war, they all considered themselves to be comprehensively Prussian. They considered themselves to be part of a greater Prussian culture and society. And because of the nature of how it was born, born out of Prussia, which was already a very militant society on its own, it, it, the army and the military was already a very big part of Prussian culture. And then on top of that, that this 
this feeling of Prussianness was being born out of the horrors of a conflict as devastating as the Seven Years' War meant that this identity was very much focused on violence and on militarism and military discipline and the philosophy of the military, which is the idea of being part of a larger whole and to contributing your own sacrificing your own self to the larger whole that became a very big part of the prussian identity and it was all being born in this time period uh, so how did it get born with all the loss he had before or is this happening at the end of the this is this is all happening as the war is going on out uh Frederick already had the respect of his people, the respect of his subjects of the Prussian people. During the war, um, it was very, very much recognized that this was a, an existential war for the security and the continued existence of Prussia. And people had a very real, real like anxiety about what their life would look like without Prussia, and more specifically, without Frederick. That was the big thing about Prussian patriotism was that it was very much centered around the person of Frederick. He represented the Prussian state. And so by extension, all Prussian people. So, and that, that was allowed to happen because he had already done so much to earn their respect and their adoration in the first place. And so when it became obvious that his position as the king of prussia was at stake during this war they came to his defense and through that collective rising to the cause is what built the prussian identity from the ground up does that make sense yes and that would be a really big part of the prussian identity for i mean to some extent to till today even people from brandenburg still consider themselves to some extent to be descended from the Prussian tradition. And the Prussian identity was almost completely wrapped up in service and devotion to Frederick. He was the Prussian identity. Everything that was Prussian was embodied in him to such a great extent that when he died, um, Prussian nationalism or Prussian patriotism took on a very like somber and nostalgic feeling to it to a certain extent it prussian nationalism was based on looking backwards to the time of frederick the great and that that's going to be very interesting with some it's another one of those things put a pin in it in your head and remember that for some of the stuff we're going to talk about near the end of the, this episode um, but to give you an idea i found this this is actually from the judicator album too but I also found this this bit from the from a poem that was written during the war. It was written by a man named Johann Wilhelm Ludwig Gleim, who is a poet and a minister in Frederick's government. The poem was called "Ode to the Muse of War," and I want I wanted to give this to give you an idea of the sort of hero worship and the sort of militaristic violence that was intricate to the Prussian identity as a result of this war. From a stream of black murderer's blood, I trod with timid foot upon a hill of corpses, saw about me far and wide that none was left to kill, stood up and peered and searched with craning neck through pitch black clouds of battle smoke for the anointed one, fixed upon him and the envoy of God his guard, my eyes and thoughts. It's very poetic, but I, I'm not really inspired by it personally. That's just me. I thought that that's one of the most impactful like passages that I've ever read in my life, personally. I'm also very drunk at the moment, Derek. I'm going to default to you. Uh, I will allow you to take a sip, but I personally... I've got a shot ready. Okay, it's up to you then. We'll, we'll make this a... What are you I'm doing thinking? a shot. Okay. Cheers. Well, yeah, the reason I wanted to talk about Prussian patriotism is because the Prussian patriotism that was born 
out of this war is what would serve as the basis for larger German nationalism going forward. So the idea of Germanness and what it means to be German, the modern conception of the German identity and German history all has its roots in this war and more specifically in Frederick himself. So when I say he's the grandfather of Germany, like I said in the first episode, you weren't kidding. This is this is what I mean. He is his rule is the embryo out of which the German identity is born. And this war is what it is born out of. This war is the labor pains of what would become Germany. Germany. So, moving on. After the war, Frederick was a miserable man. He continued to have several friendships, but at this point, he always seemed to drive people away because of the way that he would tease them. You remember how that teasing caused problems with his friendship with Voltaire all those years ago? Yes. That he was basically doing that with all of his friends now. They would love, they would love him and adore him, his friends would, but they would be driven away just by his the way that he would treat them he would think he would he would think it would be affectionate but it would come off as very cruel yeah no i understand that completely he became quiet and lonely and bitter but in his role as the king he was still just as energetic as he had always been in fact something interesting his conquering days weren't done just yet what yeah this it honestly it feels like everything is tied up and with a nice bow the story might as well end it's not done nope he still has about 20 years left on his life what (laughs) yeah don't worry we'll get through it pretty quickly not a lot happens but i'll get through the important bits so that gap of land that separated brandenburg from east prussia um that was owned by poland which you you remember how like kind of how that setup looked Mm, not really. So there's there was Brandenburg, there's Brandenburg, and then there was a bunch of land owned by Poland, and then there was East Prussia in what's now northern Poland, but that was owned by Prussia. Okay. It's very, very confusing naming. Uh, but that, that little stretch of land between Brandenburg and East Prussia, which obviously was called West Prussia, it had been a pain in Frederick's ass for decades. Especially during the war, during the Seven Years' War, it had, be, it had completely cut off East Prussia from his control, leaving it to be ravaged by Russian armies. He decided that that situation couldn't stand anymore. Poland had become weaker and weaker over the course of the 18th century. Following the end of the Seven Years' War, it was functioning essentially as a puppet of the Russian Empire. But at that time, the Polish political system was in disarray because there had just been like a brutal civil war. Poland and the puppet king uh, was starting to become a little too independence minded for Catherine's company. And so Prussia, Austria, and Russia formed a secret alliance and organized what lands that they would carve out of Poland in an invasion. And so on September 22nd, 1772, so this is about nine years after the end of. The Seven Years' War. All three of these armies invaded Poland on the same day. The invasion itself was pretty much blood- bloodless because there wasn't much of the Polish army left after so many years of mismanagement. The invading the invading armies entered and occupied their respective parcels of land without pretty much without a fight. This wasn't really a war since there wasn't any fighting. It was, but it did end with Poland losing over two hundred thousand square kilometers of land. They had to go. Yeah. Frederick had united Brandenburg and Prussia finally at last. And the majority of his country was now an easy to manage continuous landmass. By now, he was in his 60s, but the stress of war and leadership had aged him far beyond his years. His gout was becoming worse than ever. He'd lost so many teeth that he couldn't play the flute anymore. And he had chronic sores. This is really weird. He had chronic sores in his ears. What? Yeah, he had ear sores. I've never heard of such a thing. Yeah, it's very strange. But guess what? This is Frederick we're talking about. 
he still had one last war in him. Of course he did. Yeah, one last war. The Elector of Bavaria died in 1777. I guess we could go ahead and sit for that. Why not? Francis of Lorraine had also died. That's another sit. <laughs> and so at that time, the Holy Roman Emperor was now Maria Theresa's son, Joseph. When the Elector of Bavaria died, Joseph sent an army in so that he could claim Bavaria for Austria. He had grown up seeing, he had basically grown up during the Seven Years' War, and he had seen the failure of his mother to recapture Silesia from Frederick. And so he made it his goal to restore Austria to his former position of power in Germany and to try and check the power of Frederick. He thought that he could get away with uh, seizing Bavaria uh, because he thought that Frederick was too sick to respond because Frederick was very publicly and openly not in a good state at this point. And so Joseph gambled. And it turns out his gamble did not pay off. Frederick's entire foreign policy for his entire rule had been checking the power of Austria. If they took Bavaria, he'd be right back where he started when he came to the throne as a second-class power in Germany and a third-class power in the rest of Europe. And so he mobilized his army and he set off to confront the Austrians in April of 1778. But Frederick didn't really want to fight He'd gotten enough fighting in the Seven Years' War to last him the rest of his life. If possible, he wanted to get this war over with, with as little bloodshed as possible. I don't blame him. Yeah, I don't blame him either. I'd do the exact same thing. I, I would not want to see any more. <laughs> no, I would argue that even if you are a bloodthirsty leader, after the Seven Years' War, you would want what to do whatever you could to get the next war over with as fast as possible because there wasn't enough space to really breathe, grow, and recover. Yeah, even just for practical reasons. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to get dragged back into like a full-scale war. So he set up his army across the River Elba and he decided he wanted to wait for Joseph to attack him. He figured that Joseph would, because he was young, and he was fresh to military command, that he would be eager to go off and win glory. And so he would try to attack Frederick. But Joseph was still, to some extent, under his mother's influence. And his mother knew that was a really bad idea. You don't fuck with Frederick <laughs> on an, in a pitched battle. Yeah. And so no attack came. And so they just sat across from each other on opposite banks of the River Elba, from April all the way through to October. They just sat there doing nothing. They were trying to play chicken, basically, and no one would budge. Yeah, they were playing chicken. And so it became clear very quickly that neither one of them were willing to commit to a fight. And so they decided to compromise. In October, Frederick pulled his army out and went back to Brandenburg. And they started negotiations for peace treaty. In the following May... They signed a peace treaty in which Austria gave up their claim to Bavaria, and so it stayed in the house of Wittelsbach, which was the ruling house of Bavaria. It stayed in their family. And in exchange, Austria got some, like, just one little county out of Bavaria, like, right on the border. Keep in mind, Bavaria wasn't part of these negotiations. They didn't get a choice to give up this county. It was completely between Austria and Prussia. To give you an idea of how powerful Prussia was now, they were dictating terms for a country that they didn't even control. <laughs> wow. This war came to be called the Potato War. I love that. <laughs> yeah, because when both of them were just sitting on their asses watching each other across the river, um, they became their armies became reliant on scrounging the local countryside for food. That's the main way that they got fed. And the main, the main crop that they were growing in that area of Bavaria was potatoes. And so their armies basically survived on pato potatoes for that entire year. So while Frederick was in Bavaria, he got some bad news. <laughs> when does Frederick not get bad news? 
um, in May of 1778, just a month after he arrived in Bavaria, Voltaire died. And he was genuinely devastated because in the years after their very public falling out, um, they had actually picked up a correspondence again. And they had, Frederick was under the assumption that they'd actually repaired their friendship and that they were still friends. And so he was very, very emotionally hurt when Voltaire died. Frederick would not live long enough to find out that Frederick had actually been writing a whole bunch of shit about him. Like for for his entire life, Frederick had dedicated a good portion of his free time to writing um, memoirs about his time with Frederick and just filling them with complete fabrications that made Frederick look bad. And he didn't know about that because those memoirs wouldn't be published until after Frederick died. And so it's a really weird situation. Frederick was genuinely grieving for Voltaire's death, but Voltaire didn't really like... Voltaire was an asshole. Uh, so yeah, that's that's that. That's Frederick or Voltaire is gone now. The last few years of Frederick's reign were very quiet. He continued to manage his now reformed state, and he silently avoided the adoration of his subjects, who all now adored him like a demigod. He spent most of his time just trying to avoid people generally, but especially like his own subjects who he imagine like the the most famous celebrity you can think of and like knock that up to 10 the last political decision that he would make as the king of prussia i thought this was really interesting the last decision he made was the signing of a document that that was called the treaty of amity and commerce in 1785 that treaty opened up commercial trade between prussia and a young new republic in Britain's former American colonies called the United States. Prussia was the first European power to formalize trade relations with the U.S. And the treaty document itself, the actual piece of paper, bears the, signature, bears the signatures of Frederick and George Washington side by side. I thought that was really cool to find that out. I need to find a picture of it because that sounds... That sounds like it'd be really cool to look at. It does. At midnight of August 17th, 1786, the king woke in his bed in Sensushi, and he was having trouble breathing. He went into his library, and he sat in his armchair, sitting up straight so that he could ease his breathing, and he was having a quiet conversation with two of his servants. After a couple hours of just quiet, gentle conversation, he his eyes started to get heavy and he slowly lowered his head and he fell asleep and he would never open them again he was 74 years old and that was it that was that was the end of frederick the great this man did so much he did so much i'm impressed even after alexander the great like he did some more impressive things yeah. than alexander just based on his resources to be honest alexander had so much at him that he could have done whatever yeah. he wanted. It didn't matter what he had access to. Alexander had that charisma that it didn't matter if he should have done it. He did it, and he had no questions asked. Mm -hmm. That and Alexander was known for escalation after escalation after escalation. It didn't yeah. matter for him. Frederick, I don't feel like was. Frederick was a pragmatic man. He just did at things that he felt he needed. Yeah, he was... I can't even... I was about to say he was pragmatic to a fault, but he really wasn't. He was pragmatic in all of the right ways. Even at the moments that he was at his most emotionally vulnerable, he kept a level head in situations where he was needed. And that is not... that That's not something we can say about Alexander. Definitely not. Alexander almost never had a cool head. He never had a cool head. And it was a it was an asset that Frederick used to change history forever. If Frederick had been a little bit more like Alexander, we would not have gotten modern Germany, at least not in the form that we know it. We wouldn't have gotten 
a strong Prussian state like it existed. The state, the the Prus- the kingdom of Prussia that defeated Napoleon. We wouldn't have gotten that. But yeah, yeah, there are there are few individuals whose legacy has had as much impact on the modern world as Frederick. Every just in the con, it's insane that we don't teach history with more context than we do in America. Like this is important. Like even a precursory talk about Frederick the Great would be important. He was never even mentioned in my schools. I don't know about yours. I never learned about him in like, like public school. I found out about him through other, like just my own research in history. Um, I want to talk about, before we head out, I want to talk about the legacy that he left behind and the ways that he affected, the ways that he affected Germany and by extension, modern history. The, everybody, everybody was affected by his rule, his leadership. Uh, in the context of the Seven Years' War, every nation in Europe was irreversibly changed by it. Poland, of course, Poland would suffer two more partitions after Frederick's death, and the third partition would completely devour Poland. They would cease to exist as its own nation. And they wouldn't come back for over a century, not until the end of World War I. Damn. Russia, despite their lack of success in the Seven Years' War, they had per- permanently intruded themselves into the geopolitics of Europe. And their relationship with Prussia would be a defining feature of world history all the way through the 20th century. The end of the war marked the beginning of Britain's dominance in India. And the little island country, England, would control the subcontinent on the other side of the world until 1947. Speaking of Britain, the American Front of the War, which is referred to by Americans as the French and Indian War, would put British, the British government in deep, deep debt, which would prompt them to raise new and intrusive taxes on the merchant classes of the American colonies. Those taxes would prompt... So it directly led to the American Revolution? It directly led to the American Revolution. Those taxes would prompt a cycle of protest and suppression, which would eventually spiral out of control into the American War of Independence and the formation of the United States of America. Also, on top of that, I forgot to put it into my writing, but the United States Army would also be irreversibly affected by Friedrich's leadership. Have you ever heard the name Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben? Nope. Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben was an aide-de-camp to Frederick and was a general in Frederick the Great's army during the Seven Years' War. But when Frederick died, he found himself wrapped up in a in a rivalry with another general who spread a bunch of rumors about him that discredited him to the promotion board, I guess the promotion boards of the Prussian army. And so even though he was one of the best commanders in the Prussian military at that time, he was passed over for promotion to a field marshal. And so he bounced around Germany for a little bit, looking for new armies to serve until he eventually was invited to come and join the Continental Army during the War of Independence by an associate that he had in France named Benjamin Franklin. Oh, wow. He was brought over to the, brought over to America and arrived just in time to join the Continental Army while it was camped at Valley Forge in the winter of 76 and 77. His training of the Continental Army at Valley Forge is what allowed it gave the Continental Army the discipline it needed to begin to win pitched battles against the British colonial military, colonial army in America. And to this day, the basis of American basic, the U.S. Army's basic training is based on field manuals that he wrote for the Continental Army. Damn. The modern American military is based on Frederick's military. Yeah. Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben, another 
another name to know. So yeah, Frederick was instrumental in the development of the United States of America. We would not be here without Frederick. In in an indirect sense, but yes. In an indirect sense, but nonetheless, it wouldn't have happened in the same way if it weren't for him. France got it probably the worst. They had the worst outcome out of the Seven Years' War. The war impoverished the French state to such a degree that their ancient institutions and their ancient feudalism buckled under the weight of their debts. That the bankruptcy of the French state is what directly led to the revolution of 1789 and the, the which was the French Revolution. That happened only three years after Frederick's death. That doesn't surprise me. And in France, after a decade of coups and of reigns of terror, Napoleon Bonaparte would finally rise to become the emperor of France. And he would go on a conquest of all of Europe. And Napoleon was a very ardent reader of military strategy and history. And the one man who was most influential in his development, the development of his military ideas, was Frederick. Oh, goodness. So you could could argue that if it weren't for Frederick, we may not have Napoleon? I think we... I think Frederick set up the situation that allowed the French Revolution to go in exactly the way that it did that allowed Napoleon to come to power. So yeah, in a sense... I think so. Well, you could also argue, at least in my mind, because I am obviously not a history major, that if it weren't for Frederick, Napoleon wouldn't have the strategies that would have led him to victory. Um, no, because he he was he was still like he was a brilliant military genius in his own right, and he had lots of history. Like another one of his favorite, like two of his favorite. Uh, besides Frederick, two of his favorite uh, generals to study were um, oh, there's another Prussian gen- or another yeah, another Prussian general. I can't remember his name, but another Prussian general and Julius Caesar. So he still would have had ideas. Maybe his battles and his campaigns wouldn't have gone in the same way, but I think he still had it, enough of his own knowledge to be able to do the things that he did but again like without frederick i don't think there would have ever been a situation where he came to power in the first place fair 20 years after frederick's death after napoleon's conquest of germany the emperor would stand in front of frederick's graves and tell his subordinates quote hats off boys if you were still alive we should not be here I mean, that's facts. Yeah, that's facts. I think Frederick would have been the one guy who would be able to beat... I mean, I say one guy. Uh, uh, What's-his-face, the British guy was able to beat him. But Man, I have a really bad memory when I'm drunk. God. I don't know anything about Napoleon other than he was a short guy who... He wasn't actually short. short. That was just some British propaganda. But we'll get to that when we eventually cover... Alexander and or Alexander Napoleon in his own <laughs> man. I still got Na- I've still got Alexander on my mind. God, but but um, the Prussian army and the state that Frederick left behind would be instrumental in Napoleon's final defeat at the Battle of Waterloo. It would be the arrival of the Prussian army under Gebhard Leberecht von Blucher who would turn the tides in the coalition's favor. So it would be the the Prussian army that dealt the final blow to Napoleon. In the mid-19th century, King Wilhelm, the great-grandson of Frederick's successor, Frederick's successor being his nephew, I forgot to mention this, when Frederick died, his nephew Friedrich Wilhelm III came to power and inherited the throne. But the great-grandson of Friedrich Wilhelm III King of Wilhelm, would become the first emperor of a united Germany and become Kaiser Wilhelm I, 
his chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, would use his diplomatic genius to bring the divided German states into confederations with Prussia at into confederations with Prussia at its head. After defeating the French in the Franco-Prussian War, the Empire of Germany was declared in the Palace of Versailles on January 18th, 1871. With the exception of perhaps Britain, Germany was easily the most powerful nation on the planet. The end of the Franco-Prussian War would start an animosity between Germany and France, which would be wouldn't be resolved until the end of the First World War. Germany became so impoverished and unstable during the war and that it would ultimately surrender under public pressure in 1918, having sacrificed millions of Germans to the meat grinders of both the Eastern and the Western fronts. In the aftermath of the war, the people of Germany would overthrow the imperial government and declare a republic on November 9th, 1918, making Kaiser Wilhelm II the great, great, great grandnephew of Frederick, the last Hohenzollern to rule in Berlin. In the decades after, the combination of bitterness at Germany's defeat and the economic downturn of the Great Depression would combine to turn that Prussian patriotism that I was talking about. Yeah. That patriotism forged in the horrors of the Seven Years' War, the combination of all those factors in the aftermath of world war one would turn that patriotism which had now transformed into a german nationalism into its ugliest and most violent form that being adolf hitler and the nazi party the nazi party would be elected adolf hitler and the nazi party would be elected to rule germany in 1933 in 1939 they would follow in frederick's footsteps and invade the polish controlled west prussia sparking off the Second World War. The Nazis, especially Hitler, idolized Frederick as one of the greatest German leaders in the nation's history. Hitler would have a portrait of Frederick hanging in his office for his entire reign as the Fuhrer of Germany. That's pretty fucked. It was hanging on the wall of his bunker when he killed himself on April 30th, 1945, surrounded all sides by advancing Russian troops. It's likely that the last thing that he saw as he pulled the trigger of his pistol was Frederick's face staring down at him. It's more than just a little fuck. That's like all the way fucked. That's pretty fucked, yeah. In that sense, he actually accomplished the one thing that Frederick never did in the same situation. When he was surrounded by Russians, he, when Frederick was surrounded by Russians and Berlin was being occupied, Frederick didn't kill himself, but Hitler did. (laughs) Um, Yeah. After the war, Germany would be split in two, and Berlin would become the strategic and spiritual center of the Cold War, the struggle between the capitalist West and the communist East. The collapse of the Berlin Wall and the absorption of of East Germany into the Federal Republic of Germany in 1989 is considered by many to be the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. Germany still stands today as a testament to Frederick's legacy. It still lives whole and intact despite all of the carnage and the bloodshed, just as his Prussia stood against stood against all odds. I think that's Frederick's lasting mark on German society. The ability to always bounce back from existential threats for better or for worse. I mean, you're not wrong. To be- I think and that's that's all I really have to say about Frederick. What do you think? What are you, what are you thinking about Frederick and the world that he left behind? It sounds like Frederick had a lot more influence that isn't really talked about by hardly anyone. Yeah, he really did. I'm not going to say that he was 100% responsible for everything that's happened since his death, but it wouldn't have happened in the same way without him. Honestly... It feels like Frederick, while he wasn't the reason a lot of things happened the way they did, if it wasn't for him, they probably would not have him the way they did. Just because the differences that would have happened would have altered history just so significantly. Yeah, and it's 
my historical mind tries not to pass a moral judgment on a guy like Frederick because it I think it's useless to try and moralize the actions and the the legacies of historic figures can condemn obvious wrongs obviously but not try and pass moral judgment on the arc of history because history is larger than any one man but there are both amazing progressive I'd, I'd even say beautiful things that came out of frederick's rule but at the same time there are also horrific disgusting things that happened because of because of the world the the prussia that he built the militarism that was intrinsic to the culture that he that he wanted to create and the culture that he made the powerhouse of Europe had far reaching effects that resulted in the deaths and the suffering of tens and hundreds of millions of people. But at the same time, that's not something that he could have predicted or that he should even be considered to be complicit in because at the end of the day, he was just a guy with principles, some of which were misguided, but some of which were were on the on the ball, to be honest. And he did the best with what he had, and he did amazing things. So it's a it's a discussion about it's it's a it's a lesson in how we sh- we can't we can't judge history and we can't understand history based on the actions of a man even a man with far reaching reverberations like him when you try and combine like the the logic of moral culpability with the far reaching material reality of historic development it's it never works out you're right you're right i really don't know how to feel about frederick he's a it is a very conflicted figure in my mind which i suppose means that i've done something right in the way that i've read him because at the same time, I want to condemn him for the things that he did wrong and for the world that he built. But at the same time, I want to respect him for, again, for a lot of the things that he built. It's a very much a mixed bag, and it's not a simple thing to parse out. I mean, you could argue that with any person, to be perfectly honest. No one's perfectly good. No one's perfectly bad. There is always a gray area. It, there's no black and white. It's all just shades of gray, like a lot of people argue, quote unquote. It it literally is. There's no one's perfectly good. Like I know it's a dumb litmus test, but you could say, oh, the only good people return their carts at a shopping center, but you're not always going to do that, even if you're. Mar- mostly considered a good person i work at a shopping i work for walmart and i don't always return my shopping cart like most of the time i do yes but there's like once in a bloom where i don't but not every person who doesn't return their cart is a bad person because like it's that weird stupid litmus test if you do return your cart there's no benefit but you're a good person if you don't you're not doing something bad but you're still not really a good person as a it's it's something that i struggle with with a lot of historic figures is people that i want to genuinely revere but i have i can't help but keep in the back of my mind like all of the intrinsically like intrinsically bad things that are just a part of who they were it's Honestly, you have to appreciate, yes, this is a historical figure that got remembered that did many great things. They're not a good person because of that. Alexander is not a good person. Frederick is not a good person. But they did great things. Yeah, they they did amazing things. They did horrific things. And the world that they left behind, it wasn't good or bad. It just was what it was, good and bad. And that that's really hard for me to deal with as somebody like raised as an american i we're we're kind of taught to deify a lot of historic figures and that that doesn't just give us a flawed perception of specific individuals throughout history it gives us a flawed perception of how we should perceive history period and that's something that yes 100% like the founding fathers are like amazing men no, they're fucking not. Yeah. 
they did very impressive things, but they they weren't they weren't good people. <laughs> like, uh, and yeah, that's that's something that I'm always going to be struggling with, especially if people is morally complicated as Frederick. Agreed. Like, there's no way to look about people like Frederick, hell, even Alexander, and say they were bad. They were good. They are flawed men who did what they, th- not always, obviously, but they did what they were expected of. They did what they felt they needed to. Like, Alexander felt like he was a conqueror. He had to conquer. Frederick felt like he was a king. He had to watch out for his people, no matter what horrific acts he had to do. Yeah, and that's that's the best that I think that we can do is the, I think the best thing that we can do for the memory of people like this and all of their compli- complications is to try and understand them and the context in which they lived. That is the best thing that we can possibly do. And that is what I have dedicated a huge amount of my life to trying to do. Tim, any last thoughts? I feel like I've already said what I needed to on Frederick and Alexander. Like I've added like a little bit on Alexander just because it kind of relates to Frederick as the duality of man. No one is good. No one is bad. Unless you're like a really evil fuck. Like someone like our serial killers, H.H. H. Holmes, uh, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer. Unless you're people like that, you're not necessarily inherently bad. I mean, you can do bad things, but motivation is a whole, changes that perspective at least a little bit. And even people like that, like it's more helpful to understand who they were in the context of the time they they lived in and the environment that they came up in. Even then, there's the tiniest little bit of gray area to try and understand who they were. Yeah, so want to go ahead and plug podcast social medias and your social media so you can find me at tim aka otis and you can find the podcast at find us at facebook and instagram at the alexander society pod on twitter at alex society pod what about you derek where can they find you <laughs> Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Visigoth. The I is a one, the O is a zero. I talk about politics a lot. Feel free to come watch me melt down talking to turfs and chuds. And yeah, that's all for us. Uh, join us next time when we finally come over to America for our next topic. Thank you, and if you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a rate and review on your favorite streaming site. Thank you, and have a great day.